Uh, he grew up in Portland and has a history in public service, serving as the artistic director of PDX Pop Now and volunteering on the Citizen Review Committee. Outside of work, he enjoys exploring Portland's food scene and discovering different parts of the state. We are just delighted to have him with us. All right, Deborah Lindsay, I know no stranger to you, Commissioner. Um, moving into our development and investment department, um, Deborah has recently joined the green team as the construction business and workforce equity program manager. In her new role, Deborah will help um, to shape the construction equity fund that uh, this um, board approved, guide a new disparity study, and maintain key relationships with industry partners. Prior to Prosper Portland, Deborah was a consultant consultant, excuse me, for Hoffman Construction supporting the Port of Portland's massive new expansion. She holds a BA in business management and communication and has worked nationally on community of practice committees for presidents George Bush and Barack Obama, focusing on equity and inclusion in the construction industry. In her spare time, she enjoys being with family and friends and traveling, and we are just absolutely delighted to have Deborah with us as well. All right, um, next we've got Jaron Jordan, um, uh, who is joining the Economic Development Department. Um, he's the newest member of the Entrepreneurship and Community Economic Development team. He's actually not a stranger to Prosper Portland. Um, he joined the agency in 2005 as a student employee. Since then, he's worked in uh, the construction industry. He started his own contracting business. Um, and in this new role at Prosper Portland, he will support the Community Operations and Enhancement um, Program, so COEP focusing on increasing diversity in the trades and facilitating construction firms' participation in public contracting opportunities. Um, he has an MBA from Willamette University, is originally from East Cle Cleveland, Ohio, and he came to Portland to attend Portland State University, where he also played basketball. Beyond work, beyond work John enjoys traveling, cooking, and comedy. There's like lots of traveling and cooking, so it's a fun group. Uh, really delighted to have John here with us. Thanks. All right, and last but not least, um, Patrick Prince is um, joining us um, as the new program manager on the Inclusive Business Resource Network program that you all know is so important to us and to our work. He has extensive work experience in the private sector, which is really relevant in um, engaging and understanding what local businesses need, um, and worked at both Sara Lee and as a regional project manager with US Bank. Um, also a Portland State graduate in economics and community development with a diversity and inclusion minor. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, we are thrilled that Patrick now calls the Pacific Northwest home and so glad to have him as part of the team. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's a great report and uh, welcome to all of you. Super impressive group and we're delighted to have you. So uh, that was fantastic, so thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have item four. This is meeting minutes. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the December 13th meeting? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Minutes are approved unanimously. Next, we have uh, public comment. Um, Pam, do we have any individuals signed up for items uh, on the agenda or not on the agenda? We, we do. Justin has that list. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I have one card then, uh, Karanja Cruz, uh, with teaching for pur with excuse me, teaching with purpose, Mr. Cruz. Welcome. And our public. Oh sure, yeah, great. How's that? Um, great, thanks. So you have, sorry to be picky about it, but you have three minutes. All right, no problem. Okay, thanks. I just got my supporters. Behind me, right? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Honorable members of the commission, um, I come before you today not just as a native of Northeast Portland who has lived with the pain of gentrification, but as a living testimony of a lineage that has endured through the hardest chapters of our history. I recently did a family research and I found that I'm a direct descendant of an enslaved man named Jeffrey Cruz, whose legacy, resilience, and fortitude courses through my veins. Jeffrey had a son named John Cruz, who was identified merely as a laborer in the Census Bureau, a stark reminder of the limit, 
opportunities that a black man in that era, even in today's era in America. Yet, John's bloodline did not succumb to the restraints of his time. He fathered two sons, of whom one is my grandfather, his name is Hosea Cruz, a man <clears throat> with unyielding resolve, moved his family to Portland, Oregon to serve as a dignitary and as a railroad porter. Hosea's lineage includes a son named Charles Cruz, my own father, whose name is synonymous with the progress. Charles transcended the boundaries of his predecessors, becoming the first of his family to graduate from college, Portland State University. His pioneering spirit established the first black student union at Portland State, and his entrepreneur drive led him to open up the first black-owned bicycle shop in the 1970s. Imagine if that shop was still open today. In the 1970s, bore witness to an awakening, a time when black consciousness, Afros, and slogans of black, and I'm black and I'm proud. This awakening even impact some of our names, hence Karanja Cruz, Yuhuru Cruz, my brother, rest in peace. But following the decades cast a shadow over our strides. As the war on drugs preyed upon black communities in the 1980s, my father, despite his ambition, was caught in this destructive wake. The very fabric of our livelihood was threatened as crack cocaine infiltrated our neighborhoods, and including gangs. A stark contrast to the Just Say No campaign during that era. Our family's history is marred by poverty, but illuminated by audacity, the audacity to uproot, to innovate, and to enrich communities. Despite the systematic barriers by institutions like Portland Development Commission, now known as Prosper Portland, which has historically disenfranchised our people, yet we have persevered. Our goal is to shatter the chains of generational poverty and to forge a legacy of generational wealth. The North and Northeast Community Development Initiative Action Plan speaks of nurturing generational wealth. This aspiration can be realized with equitable access to capital, an access that is, has to be non-convictional. My team and I are posed to purchase the commercial property on 15th and Killingsworth armed with no capital, but with an abundance of knowledge and a profound understanding of our community's needs. Traditional avenues will not see us through this endeavor. It will require a proposal that garners a unequivocal support by you commissioners. I urge you commissioners to consider our plight, our potential, and this historical debt to the communities that has undercut far too long. Let this moment mark a turning point where you decide to invest in the promise of our future rather than the echoes of our past. I thank you deeply for your time and willingness to entertain this hope and change and this potential to create generational wealth. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you for coming and thanks for your testimony. We appreciate that. Thank you. I understand that this um, has to do possibly with a cultural business hub development, and there's, I guess there is a, a, an ongoing request for expressions of interest, and Kimberly mentioned that in her proposal, so I hope you'll apply for that or, you know, contact the staff on that. Yeah, issue. definitely. Great. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Saying. All right. Thank you for your time. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's no other, no other folks today. No yeah. more. Okay. No more. All right. Excellent. So next we'll go to the consent agenda. Um, we have several consent agenda items. I think we can um, address them all at once. Is that correct? Justin? We can do all of the items at once. So we have three different uh, resolutions. Resolution 7514, 7515, and 7516. Would someone like to make a motion to approve all of those resolutions. Motion to approve. Thank you. We have a second? Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, they pass unanimously. Thank you. Okay. So now uh, we are going to adjourn.
Okay. The meeting of the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners is now adjourned. The members of the Prosper Portland Board will now meet as the agency's local audit committee to consider the next item on the agenda. So this is an action item accepting and approving the annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year 2022-23 and accepting the communication with those charged with governance. Um, so uh, we have several folks here on that behalf, including, um, just a moment, uh, including our new City of Portland auditor, Simone Reed. Hi. Welcome. Hi. We're very happy to have you. Um, and uh, Tony Barnes and Keith Simovic. Uh, hopefully they're here too. So welcome, Tony. I hope Keith, uh, is Keith coming today too? He's online. Oh, he's online. Great. Hi, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, please um, take it away. Well, good afternoon, Chair Cruz and Commissioners. I'm City Auditor Simone Reddy. You can call me Madam Auditor or Auditor Reddy if you'd like. Uh, joining me online is Keith Simovic, a partner at Moss Adams, our outside accounting firm, and Tony Barnes, Prosper Portland's Chief Financial Officer. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to present to you the results of the financial statements audit and answer questions you might have. This is my first opportunity since I took office in January 2023. I have a slide, a few slides, yeah. There it is. So the mission of the city auditor's office is to ensure open and accountable city government. City charter makes my office responsible for auditing the performance of our city government, including Prosper Portland. My office also oversees the financial audit of Prosper Portland and presenting audit results publicly allows our community to engage with us. Next slide, please. I want to take this opportunity to highlight the difference between performance audits and financial audits. Performance audits review the efficiency, effectiveness, and equity of a program or service, and the topics and methods are at my discretion. For example, we evaluated Prosper Portland's Small Business Relief Fund in 2021, and that audit looked at whether there were systems in place to ensure the integrity of the grant program. By contrast, a financial audit is a review of the financial statements, and it follows state and federal law and accounting standards. The objective of this financial audit was to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements as a whole were free from material misstatement or whether they were significantly off. Next slide. I also want to highlight the different roles of management in my office. Prosper Management prepared the financial statements and was also responsible for putting internal controls in place. My office oversaw the financial audit as part of our contract with the firm Moss Adams. This provided additional separation between auditors and management to enhance independence and increase trust in the results. We also ensured coordination between the Prosper Portland Financial Audit, the City Financial Audit, and the federally required single audit. The financial statements and audit are an important resource for community members, as well as taxpayers and, and investors who buy the city's and Prosper Portland's debt, as well as decision makers like you. Interested parties can use them to see what financial shape Prosper Portland is in. I appreciate Prosper Portland's finance staff for facilitating a smooth audit and answering requests from the outside auditors. I want to thank Moss Adams for their continued excellence and professionalism in performing financial audits on our behalf. Uh, Mindan Vung, 
the contract manager for financial audits from my office's audit service division is here to answer questions and he can also set up a meeting with you after today's presentation. Now I'd like to turn over the presentation to Keith, after which we can hear public testimony and your questions. And Tony also has some closing remarks. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Perfect, thank you, Madam Auditor. Good afternoon, Chair Cruz and fellow commissioners. Excited to be here uh, again this year as uh, Moss Adams has served for the Independent Auditor for Prosper Portland um, and a number of uh, uh, various oddities under our contract with the, with the City of Portland Auditor's Office. Uh, to perform these services each and every year. So we're very excited to be back and always excited for this meeting as this is the tail end of, of the process, right? The accumulation of um, all the work that has been done throughout the year by uh, the staff and management at Prosper Portland and all of the audit work that, that our team has gone through um, in coordination with the city auditor's office as well in managing this contract and to be able to come forth uh, with our final audit results as we did finalize the audit uh, on schedule back in the tail end of October. Uh, and got a chance to actually meet with the audit liaisons as we typically do right around that same time frame uh, before we release our actual audit opinions uh, to go through the results in, in uh, more detail there and answer any questions that they had along the way. This is our chance to present those results and uh, solicit any feedback or, or questions that any of you might have along the way with the uh, results that we have here. So Justin, if you could move forward uh, to the next slide, I believe this is just a quick introduction of the core group of our, of our team, of auditors. Of course, we have more than just the, the four that you see on here. Uh, probably at any given time um, during our field work, we probably had uh, about six or seven of us working on this engagement. So a few more staff and other seniors involved uh, from what you see on the page here. Uh, but in addition to myself, uh, we have Lori Tish, who actually leads our firm's government services industry group. Uh, she has been involved as our quality control reviewer on the Prosper Portland audit for, for a few years now. Very excited to have her back. Her role is very key. It's it's something that our firm has on every single audit that we do, that we have this QC reviewer that is uh, someone that's experienced in the industry, is a partner or senior manager level, um, and they have to look at certain key documents in our audit process, in our risk assessment, making sure that we follow through on what we said we were going to do during our planning uh, process of the engagement. Uh, making sure all of our final del deliverables include all of the required content uh, that our professional uh, standards set forth. Uh, and of course, she is reading through that final, um, what's called the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. So quite quite the mouthful there, which is, we now call the, the ACT for, for short. So she definitely reads through that and make sure you have all of the uh, required disclosures that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, the GASB, requires as well. So key role there, happy to have Lori back on the team this year. Harvey Wang, also, this is uh, uh, an engagement he's been on for a few years now. He served as the audit manager, uh, someone that's really in charge of our team during our fieldwork process, right? When all of our staff and seniors are assigned to the engagement and they're going through and doing the detailed testing work, Harvey's the one that is overlooking um, the procedures that they're doing, making sure that we're getting everything that we need, uh, communicating, he's a key person in communicating with the staff and management at Prosper Portland as well, alongside David Levitsky, uh, who kind of served a, a co role with Harvey on that this year. David's been on the engagement for, for a number of years as well. So excited to have him back on the team this year. That's the core group of our of our engagement team. Go ahead and move forward, Justin, if you can. Uh, lots of words on this page, but this is just a kind of a recap of the different reports that we issue as part of this process, right? And I think the, the one that you're probably uh, most familiar with is going to be kind of the first item on there. That's that's really the end goal of, of all of this, to get that report over the fairness and accuracy of the financial statements. And how do we get to that point? It's through all the uh, initially risk assessment that we're doing. And part of that is definitely looking at your system of internal controls. What are those processes and procedures, those checks and balances in place uh, that, that your staff, your management team have in place at Prosper Portland to basically do their own uh, level of review and, and auditing, uh, so to speak, of the transactions as they're flowing through the organization and getting captured and recorded and reflected within your accounting system. Uh, so that's a very key process in our uh, uh, in, uh, look at internal controls and our overall risk assessment. That informs our uh, the level of detail and, and depth that we have to go through 
uh, once we actually have final numbers from Prosper Portland, once the books and records are closed for the fiscal year ended June 30th. So it's a very key part of what we're doing. That actual testing that we're doing once we have those final numbers consists of a number of different procedures. Uh, most namely is gonna be our substantive testing that we're doing, the, the detailed sampling and tying back to uh, underlying records, contracts, agreements, um, and making sure what is recorded, what is reflected uh, in Prosper Portland's accounting records is consistent with that substantive documentation. Were things recorded at the correct amount? Were they recorded in the correct period? Uh, were they classified in the correct account and reflected that way appropriately in your ACFR report as well? Those are the types of things that we're looking for as we're going through. Uh, and of course, we're also doing kind of an analytical review. We're kind of stepping back, taking that 30,000 foot view and saying, hey, when we look at the results for the end of the year, all of the activities and transactions that we're seeing reflected in your ACFR, uh, do they kind of make sense? And do they kind of jive with what we'd expect to happen based on reading through the transactions for the year? What, what's been, what's transpired in uh, as we read through the minutes of the commission? Of course, we're reading through those through the course of the year. Uh, we're talking to your management team to get an idea of, hey, what, what's new? What's different this year? What happened? How did you perform um, in line with budget? Uh, those are the types of things that we're looking at, and we synthesize all that information, kind of compare it to what we're actually seeing reflected in your accounting records uh, to see where we need to dig down further. So those are the types of procedures we're doing to get to a point where we've gathered enough evidence and we can say uh, to a degree of certainty and in line with our professional standards, do we believe that financial report, that ACFR, is uh, prepared in accordance with, with GASB and the, the accounting uh, requirements and does it present the the records of Prosper Portland uh, in a in a fair and accurate representation of the finances of the organization? That's the goal at the end of the day. Your team, because they pre uh, prepare an ACFR, which is something that's really outside of kind of the uh, what's required in our in our audit process, is is you're kind of taking an extra step and uh, submitting that to the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, for the uh, annual award for the Certificate of Excellence in Achievement in Financial Reporting. Uh, that's something where you've got a team that's got the, the skill set to put together that document, that's got more than just the baseline requirements uh, for an audit, um, and to submit that each and every year to receive that award, which is very, very important uh, and definitely helps out uh, for, for any third party uh, relying on your financial statements, if you were going out and wanting to, to issue debt or things of that nature, having that definitely helps to support the accuracy and fairness uh, and presentation of your financial records. So very key there. Item number three, it's a separate report that we have to issue because you're a governmental organization. Uh, we are excuse me, we have to follow governmental auditing standards as well. And so that requires us to issue a separate report that's a little bit different from uh, the corporate audit standards um, uh, in that we issue this separate report that reports out if there were any significant deficiencies or what we'd call material weaknesses in internal controls. That's kind of the red flag language you wanna be on the lookout for. Uh, if we had those, we have to put them those in this report and that gets attached to your ACFR as well. Uh, we didn't have anything, spoiler alert, we didn't have anything that rose to that level, so good news there. Uh, this is also the report where we have to note if we noted any non-compliance with any laws and regulations that are tied in with the financial reporting process. So uh, that's that's what's in, included within that report. Because you are an organ, uh, a governmental organization, we also have to uh, submit a separate report on your compliance with certain state laws and regulations. So there's certain state statutes uh, that the Secretary of State Audits Division wants us to look at uh, as your independent audit firm. So any organ governmental organization has to go through this process and have this separate audit report issued by their audit firm uh, that says whether you're in compliance with a number of different things that are bullet pointed uh, within that report. Most notably is going to be your uh, procurement process, whether you're following all the state uh, statutes and requirements for competitive bidding. Uh, and then also your budgeting process. Are you follow, following through on Oregon state law for Oregon, Oregon budget law and how are you preparing your budget? Uh, that report, that act for report also gets submitted to the Secretary of State Audits Division each and every year uh, because of their filing requirements. There's a, a cover page that goes with that that we have to take a look at. That's your summary of revenues and expenditures just to make sure everything written in there is consistent with your act for. We've taken a look at that. That's all been submitted to the Secretary of State uh, in line with their timeframe and, and requirements. And then we issue a separate letter 
each and every year that's called the communication to those charged with governance that is addressed really to to you as the commissioners as the governing body of the organization and it's really intended to give you more information on the audit process uh whether whether we had significant findings or not this is something we have to issue to to make it very explicit and clear uh how the audit process went outside of just did you get a clean opinion or not? This is telling you, well, did you run into issues along the way? Were there disagreements with management? Did you get all the information that you had requested? Did you feel everyone was transparent uh, during your conversations along the way? Those are the types of things, uh, if there were audit adjustments. Uh, so we're gonna go through a few of the highlights there here in a minute too. Those are all the various reports that we issue as part of this process. Go ahead and uh, advance the slides, Justin. At the end of the day, this is the important thing that you wanna see. And again, we'll, we'll dive into what's in the, that communication to those charged with governance to give you a little more flavor for uh, how the audit went. But at the end of the day, this is what you're going to see in those audit reports. If you look at the ACFR and you identify each of these reports that I just went over and what they're intended to do, you're going to see that your report of the fairness and accuracy of the financial statements, clean, unmodified opinion, exactly what you're looking for. Uh, any third party that sees these, the, they want to know, hey, did you, did you get an annual audit? Um, uh, was it performed by an independent audit firm? And also, uh, did you receive a, a clean audit opinion? Are these, is this a set of financial statements that aligns with GASB uh, reporting? Um, and does it present a fair and accurate representation of, of the organization? So very key piece there, goes back to all the work that your team has done throughout the year to get to that point, so very key. Uh, the organ minimum standards report, all those compliance requirements that we have to look at, we didn't have any compliance findings that, that came up this year, so good news there. And then our government auditing standards report, uh, that's the one that I mentioned will note whether you had significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, which I already mentioned. You don't have any of those, which is really, really good news. It means that you have a good set of internal controls in place that's really going to catch any of the big misses uh, 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 or things that could slip through the cracks throughout the year, right? So very good news there. That's something that we have to look at each and every year, that system of internal controls and whether we believe you have a system in place where uh, you've got uh, segregation of duties, multiple checks and balances so that uh, you'd be able to prevent or detect uh, material errors or fraud along the way. Go ahead and advance the slide. These are some of the highlights from our uh, communication to those charged with governance. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these items, but some of the things that I like to call out each and every year. One related to accounting policies, there's a paragraph in there uh, really kind of focused at, hey, did, did anything change in how your financial statements are presented this year compared to previous years? Uh, it typically, uh, one of the tenets of, of financial reporting and financial accounting is that you're really not changing what you're doing from year to year. You want to have consistency, um, comparability from year to year. Unless uh, you know Gatsby allows for it, or if there's a new accounting standard that comes out that really forces an organization to uh, change their accounting policies, right? And so that's exactly what happened this year. Uh, there was a new accounting standard that, and I don't want anyone to memorize the number on this or anything like that. But Gatsby 96, a uh, new standard that came out this year. We talked through this more in depth, of course, with the the audit liaisons. But uh, if you read through the ACFR report, you'll see mention of this standard. This is the new subscription-based IT standard really requiring you to identify any long-term uh, IT commitments where you have software that that Prosper Portland doesn't own but they're paying a subscription fee or a licensing fee to be able to use that software for a period of time so that's triggered some different accounting where you really have kind of an asset and liability as if you purchase the software so you have an asset as is, as if it's yours and a liability as if you took out debt to finance that that's kind of what's happening here you did have an impact from that uh, your, your team did a great job at uh, reviewing the standard, getting an understanding of it, really digging down, um, diving into the uh, uh, the contracts and IT agreements that were out there, figuring out what meets the, the standard and the criteria under the standard and changing their accounting um, uh, records as a result. So that's something you'll see this year that's a little bit different than previous years. Audit adjustments, always want to call that out and just be clear that we didn't have any material audit adjustments. So through the testing that we did, nothing popped out that would suggest that you had material errors in how things were recorded, right? So we're looking for, again, was anything recorded at the wrong amount, wrong period, um, uh, not recorded and, and should have been? Those are the types of things that we're looking for uh, if there are material errors and we didn't know any in the current year. So very good news there. I'll say also, uh, all the documentation that we requested, we were provided with that. Every uh, question that we had for your staff 
and management team along the way, we were provided with answers uh, and typically very quickly as well. So we felt everyone was was open, uh, available, and uh, didn't place any limits on the scope of our engagement this year. Very good news there. Uh, in terms of other op observations and recommendations, uh, I mentioned that we didn't have any things that rise to the most kind of severe level that that we have in our audit speak, which is material weaknesses in internal controls. We didn't have anything like that, uh, but we did have various best practices and other communications that we discussed with uh, both the audit liaisons and the management team to kind of improve on their uh, financial reporting and, and how they kind of put together that act for document and review it uh, each and every year. So we went through that in a little bit uh, more in depth. Uh, during that meeting, uh, but again, nothing that rose to a more significant level to bring to this group. So very good news there. That means overall, uh, this process was was again uh, very efficient, very healthy. Um, you know, these best practice recommendations are always something that you look for out of this process to help you continue to address items uh, before they grow into a, a, a bigger issue along the way, um, and to make sure those things are getting addressed and um, um, updated each and every year. So good news there. Go ahead and advance the slides. Other than that, just a big thank you to everyone that was involved in this process. Uh, I know we don't mention on there, but uh, we got a chance to work with Karan this year as well. So we're very excited to continue to work with her down the road. And, and definitely, you know, some some new folks that were involved in this process this year. A little bit of change uh, and, and new faces in the finance and accounting department. And overall, we were very pleased with the with the results of this and working with them and the ability to kind of continue to hit these time frames uh, and fairly quick turnaround overall. I have a lot of governmental organizations that I work with that are June 30th year ends that uh, don't finalize their audits nearly as quickly as um, uh, all the entities that we work with under our contract with the city of Portland. So uh, it's a quick turnaround, a lot of work that goes in this process and a big thank you to everyone and some of the new faces that were involved in this process this year. Very impressed with their with their work. Other than that, um, I think we're just open to any questions that any of you might have. Commissioners have any questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate that very much. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I, it's not usually a lot of questions when you come out with it, such a clean audit. Um, so I just wanted to say once again, great job to our team and thank you for Moss Adams and uh, just wanted to leave it at that. So. Tony, were you going to make a few Yes, thank you, Com <clears throat> Chair Cruz, Commissioners, Executive Director Branham. I just had a few closing comments um, for this uh, for this item. Uh, give my great appreciation to Otter Reddy and um, Min Dan Vong of the Auditor's Office for their continued uh, uh, management and facilitation of the audit process, um, working with Moss Adams and Prosper Portland. Also, like to thank, of course, Moss Adams, um, Keith, Harvey Wang, uh, David Litsky, and the entire Moss Adams team for their very thorough engagement um, on the audit and the annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, the engagement spans about five months, um, and we appreciate really close partnership with Moss Adams and the auditor's office on that. Uh, great appreciation to the Prosper Finance team. Um, includes Keith Padilla, uh, Kale Se Chow, uh, Terry Rosales, Chan Se Lee, uh, Courtney Cohn, Trevor A. Brandon, Gina Bixby, and Brad Reynolds in preparing all the requested materials uh, for the audit, but also their ongoing work throughout the whole fiscal year, last fiscal year and through this fiscal year. Um, a special thanks to Gina and Brad for their work in um, implementing the, some of the new accounting pronouncements. Uh, Keith mentioned uh, GASB 96, coordinating all the audit requests, preparing the annual comprehensive financial report, uh, which includes that submission to the Government Finance Officers Association. So great appreciation to the finance team and everybody at Prosper Portland for uh, supporting the finance team through the process too. So thank you. Great, thank you, Tony. And uh, do we have, we don't have any testimony about this. this is, yeah, okay, great. Well, then, uh, just thanks very much, and thanks again to uh, Madam Auditor for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, I would just add my own uh, appreciation to the staff and everybody who worked on this, Keith and the Moss Adams team. We're really spoiled as uh, commissioners with this. Every year since I've been on the board, Willie as well, uh, it's been a sparkling clean audit, and uh, I think every year, I don't know if there have ever been any exceptions, but we've received that certificate of, of excellence, which is really impressive, you know, and uh, 
I think we're so used to it, it kind of just passes right by. So I want to call that out uh, as, as an amazing achievement every year. So, uh, so thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So next up. Chair Cruz. Yes. You'll want to call for uh, a motion, a second, oh, to a discussion, approve. a vote to approve resolution. Uh, sure, yes. We actually do have a resolution on this, don't we? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. Would uh, someone like to make a motion to approve resolution 7517, accepting and approving the annual report? I so move. Thank you. Yeah, second. A second. Oh, thank you. I think she beat you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, so now uh, we will go back to our regular agenda items. Um, we'll, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for my special magic language. Uh, <laughs> with that, the meeting of the audit committee is adjourned and we will reconvene with the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting to consider the next item on the agenda. Okay. So that brings us to the regular agenda. Uh, action item 10. This is approving a loan to Creative Homies and Kay Little and Carlos Marino uh, will present on this. Welcome. Carlos and Kay. No, you're not. Okay, it's Carlos. <laughs> Just playing solo today. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Justin, can we get the slides up? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cruz and Commissioners. I am Carlos Moreno, a Senior Business Finance Officer here at Prosper Portland, and I'm happy to be here with you to present the Creative Homies loan request. Next slide, please. I'm here today to, requ to request your approval of the terms of a commercial property redevelopment loan and a thriving small business loan to Creative Homies LLC in an amount not to exceed $700,000 for the redevelopment and working capital needs of a project located at 433 Northwest 4th Avenue in downtown Waterfront Tip District. Next slide, please. During this presentation, I would like to provide a little bit of, a con of context regarding the project and the borrowers. I'll start by briefly discussing the site and the project and vision, followed by how it aligns with the advanced Portland strategy and the Old Town action plan. Additionally, I'll provide some details regarding the project financials and the loan terms, much of which has already been presented um, to you on our board reports. Next slide, please. The site project is here in Old Town at the, with the address of 433 Northwest 4th Avenue, uh, well known as, a, as the Horizon Enterprise Building. It's right on the corner of 4th and Gleason. It's a 200,000, sorry, 20,000 square foot, four-story building. Um, and the project is looking to bring entertainment, foot traffic, and workspace here in the community. Next. The borrower, Creative Homies LLC, is an Oregon limited liability company that was created by majority partner Cyrus Coleman, which is a graphic designer for Nike, and Adwale Agbula, a professional photographer, which uh, we all know just as Wale. Um, they purchased the building through owner financing in December of 2021. Recently, they have brought in a couple of new partners, uh, Jessica Burke and Jonathan Cohen, which are owners of the Society Hotel, just a couple blocks from here, also here in Old Town. Uh, Creative Homies are looking to optimize the full 20,000 square foot building. The building basements will be home to the Downbeat, a speakeasy style lounge that will feature live jazz entertainments on a regular basis. The ground floor will host an art gallery, coffee shop, wine bar, and retail space. The second floor will be home to the Theory Market Maker Space with an open workspace and equipment rental available for different artists and creatives. The top floor will house a production studio and a suite available to the resident artists. I would also like to note that Wale is here and available today to make some additional remarks on the project. Next slide, please. I would like to note that this uh, project aligns with the advanced Portland strategy. Um, 
Specifically, there's a couple bullet points that are noted. Your action on this loan helps to deliver on several advanced Portland objectives, including supporting activation of ground floor commercial spaces in Old Town as we seek to support vibrant downtown, and promoting equi equitable wealth creation by allowing entrepreneurs to start and grow businesses through property ownership and business support. In this case, supporting both the building operators and many independent creatives and artists that will work within that space. Next slide, please. This project also aligns with the current five-year action plan for Old Town, Chinatown, uh, most notably section 2.1 and 2.2. Action point 2.1 notes neighborhood business and retail. Expand and enhance re retail with emphasis on neighborhood supported services by supporting current neighborhood businesses and investing in new businesses. Action 2.2, entrepreneurship. Foster a supportive environment for startup businesses and expansion, especially for owners who are people of color. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the business financials, the borrowers have been resourceful in securing a diverse capital stack for this $5 million project. They have lined up two SBA loans for the, that are dependent on securing this current $700,000 Prosper Portland loan. They secured three private loans, uh, which were utilized for the down payment of the building, another one to help them with the carrying cost over as they develop the concept, and lastly, the third one will be used for, uh, for working capital that will be received after they receive their certificate of occupancy. They've also received two grants, one from Prosper Portland, uh, the PIP grant, and the second one for being classified as first place in first place for uh, Pitch Black. Additionally, there's been some equity they've injected into the project and have also had a couple open, open um, house events for that have fundraised a few, some funds as well. Next slide, please. I would like to note the different uses of the loans. Uh, the first one, the CPRL, the Commercial Property Redevelopment Loan of $147,000 has been earmarked for hard construction costs while the thriving small business has four different categories underneath it. The first classification of $156,000 will go towards the SBA loan closing costs, $100,000 towards interest reserves to help cover some of the SBA interest over the first year. $95,000 will be used towards fixtures, furniture, and equipment, and the remaining $200,000 will be dispersed after they've received their certificate of occupancy to be used towards working capital. Next slide, please. Wanted to highlight the suggested um, terms for this loan. The CPRL loan would have a 1% interest rate, I'm sorry, 1% origination fee, a fixed 7% interest rate, 12 months deferred payment period, 24 month interest only period, followed by repayment of uh, over 12 years, amortized over 25 years, which would cre be creating a balloon payment uh, due at maturity of the loan. The second, pay, uh, the second loan, the Thriving Small Business Loan, the larger one of the two, would carry a 2% origination fee, a flat 8% interest rate, 12-month deferred payments period, a 12-month interest-only payment period, followed by a 10-year fully amortized loan, which would leave no balloon payments. I would like to note that both of these would be funded with the Old Town Action Plan Resources Funds, which gives us the flexibility to utilize these resources um, as noted previously under all these broad sources, uses, apologies. Um, I would like to highlight some of the other equity impact this project would have. This project supports the reactivation of the Old Town Business District and furthers the advanced Portland goals and the Old Town strategy um, of wealth creation through access to capital for property ownership it supports people of color entrepreneurs through business assistance and finance services. It identifies gaps in capital access across existing ecosystems and a focus on increasing access to financing. And project creates a diverse mix of job opportunities within Central, C Central City and Old Town. Next slide, please. To conclude, I'd like to restate our recommendation and request for the board to approve a commercial property redevelopment loan and thriving small business loan to Creative Homies LLC in the amount not to exceed $700,000 for the redevelopment 
and working capital needs of the project located at 433 Northwest 4th Avenue in downtown Waterfront TIF District. Now I, ha now I would like to open the conversation to, to any comments and questions from the chair and board. Thank you. No, yeah. What happened? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I can repeat the question. Sure. Uh, basically, I just wondered how the loan to value was calculated mm -hmm. and whether or not, I'm assuming you don't have like an as-built appraisal and I just wondered uh, how that was applied. There was an appraisal performed um, over the summer and in the full CAFE report, there was a breakdown of loan to value and it was compared to the current value to the projected value. Okay, great. And then how about on the um, debt service coverage, was that based on some projections from the borrower or? Correct, the borrower provided a pro forma and that was the base for the debt coverage service ratio. Okay, well my, my only thought about this is given that those numbers are a little bit inconsistent with our normal parameters, I'm wondering maybe, maybe we should talk about this as a policy matter in the future um, not even policy, just, you know, how do we treat situations that don't really fit within our kind of even analytical tools, really? Because like a debt service coverage ratio um, that is below the amount necessary to service the loan doesn't, um, you know, doesn't look good. And I'm sure that we're looking at this as in context as a, you know, cultural business hub and providing other things to the community. Um, but I think we should kind of line up our tools in a manner consistent with how we analyze it. Does that make sense? So maybe maybe that's something Kay and I can talk about with later, so. Okay, does anybody have any other comments? No? Okay, uh, before we vote, we should have invited testimony, I believe. Uh, I think you mentioned um, Wally. I Wally. Uh, I, is that you, Wally? Is what Wally. <laughs> Wally. Okay. Great. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, my name is Ada Wale. I'm a first-generation immigrant, Nigerian from Nigeria. I was raised in London. Uh, I'm a photographer and creative director in town. Um, I moved there in 2020, and my business partner, Cyrus Coleman, and I met in Minneapolis while he was on a trip. But uh, we share the same meaning for community and gathering and bringing people we love and enjoy people together. So Cyrus and I decided we wanted to create a studio space, but through looking around Portland, we couldn't really find anything. But we were lucky enough to be introduced to Jesse Burke. And she basically was like, you know, do you want to rent or create generational wealth? And Cyrus and I were like, the idea of generational wealth sounds quite amazing. <laughs> so um, one of the biggest thing of this project is uh, we really love our community. We understand our community. And one of the biggest thing working in a creative community here, it's Portland is losing a lot of black creative to all the biggest city like New York, LA, London. We wanted to make sure we keep those people here in town, so we partnered up with other creative agencies in town and other places to help keep those creating a culture here. But also, we came from a very rich background of music and artistry. Cyrus's dad is the BB King drummer for 32 years, so he comes from a very rich music. I come from a very rich artistic background. So we want to bring this to town to celebrate the culture around Chinatown because Chinatown is the epic center for culture here. And there's a bunch of people that look like us to walk around here. And we really want to bring that and celebrate that part. And we're so thankful for having creative partners such as Arvist and Carlos and Jonathan and just a bunch of people around us. And we've been fortunate enough to win Pitch Black by 51% and we went first, which is unheard of in the term of the entire thing, which means the creative community and the black community and the brown community here really wants this to happen. We're also thankful for people like industry advertising who have done all of our basically 
branding and everything for free, pro bono. And we've also been able to get Shout Outwear to really give us a lot of things too. So there's a bunch of people in this community who really wants this project to go through. So we're really, really excited for this because it's going to open a new door to this community and it's going to bring a new life to this community here that really, really needs it. And we're hoping to make this happen and we're hoping to kind of get things going. So we have a couple of things we want to show you. We worked with Arvis, uh, no, sorry, we work with Oast Architecture who basically have come up with this model. This is the jazz club, which is gonna be called the Black Note, and it's quite beautiful and charming. <laughs> JC's, let's bring that up. Uh, this is gonna be the Speakeasy, which is gonna have a memorabilia from like BB King and all the little cool things that we have around town. And then the first floor is going to be a complete coffee shop by morning, wine bar by day, and then we're going to have a full gallery space that's about 4,000 square feet down here. And it's gonna feature artwork from brown and black people and everyone around the world, so yeah. And then on the second floor is a complete maker space. You can find tailoring, you can find screen printing, you can find podcast room, you can find rooms to rent as a creative, as an artist. If you just wanna leave your house, you can come down and we'll be here for you. And then on the third floor, which is basically my big passion, I've been a photographer for the last 15 years. We have a full production company that is gonna be servicing videos and film for any advertising firms, any agency in town. I wanna to bring something big to town real quick. As a photographer, I've traveled all around the world to shoot at different studios. One thing that really, 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 really messes with me is not having a place to stay that is close to the studio. So this entire third floor is gonna have a one bedroom residency apartment for artists and creative and photographers, if you're traveling from out of the country or out of anywhere, you have a place close to the studio, and you have a place that can foster everything you need. So yeah. So by closing, thank you so much for giving me the time and giving me just the space to explain this really beautiful and amazing project. We've been working on this project for the last two and a half years, and it's been our night and day. Every day we work on this and we meet with these really generous people who has given us the time and just the space to create. And hopefully you guys can come down and see it and check it out. Maybe listen to one of your favorite jazz musicians in the basement and we'll have a cocktail with us sometime soon. So thank you so much for your grace and your time. Thanks very much for coming today. And uh, it's an exciting, exciting project. Do the commissioners have any comments they'd like to make? Please. I just want to say thank you for taking a chance and opening up a business as so many are closing in, in Old Town in Northwest Portland and really believing in Portland as it used to be. It did have lots of creative and lots of music, so I'm happy to see that coming back. And so it makes me feel good about what Portland is going to become. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you thank so you much. All. Thank you. Uh, as, as a person who's has worked in the creative industry uh, during Portland's heyday. Uh, seeing projects like this just just brings joy to my heart. Uh, so thank you for you know believing in your passion project. It could be your full time project, your day project, your night project, your uh, residency project. <laughs> uh, it is you know the the, the mix of uh, just different types of art and creativity in a single space. I hope can be a unifying factor for both the neighborhood, a region, and a community that needs it. So. Uh, I'm thrilled to see it, and we'll totally take you up on the offer to, to go listen to some music sometime. That sounds wonderful. Looking forward to it. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. We have no more discussion. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion to approve resolution number 7518? So moved. Second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Second. Second. Great. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Approved. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, next we have item 11. This is another action item authorizing the terms of the development agreement relating to the design and construction of a private mixed use development and public infrastructure at and near Northeast 102nd Avenue and Pacific Street in the Gateway Tax Increment Financing District. And also authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Portland. Bureau of Transportation to fund infrastructure improvements in the Gateway Tax Increment Finance District. And Brian Orr, or excuse me, Brian Moore and Joel Devilcourt will present. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Chair Cruz, uh, board members, and Director Branham. Uh, I'm Brian Moore, Development Manager with Prosper Portland, and with me today is Joel Devalcourt, pro uh, Project Manager. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the Gateway Development Agreement and IGA uh, to you, a project we've been working on for the last two years. Um, the, uh, the agenda item requests approval of a development agreement between Prosper Portland, David Douglas School District, Madomi LLC, and a corresponding intergovernmental agreement with the City of Portland's Bureau of Transportation. Uh, to, the purpose is to fund infrastructure improvements in Gateway that we believe are critical to support development of new housing. Uh, for some context, uh, next slide. Um, we start our economic development uh, strategy with, uh, with Advanced Portland. Uh, and this particular project isn't a typical housing project. Uh, it represents innovation in housing production through modular housing design, uh, driving outcome 1.1, 1 .1, uh, investment in traded sector uh, cluster industries, and addresses outcome 3.8, uh, production of housing across a continuum of affordability. Um, what in particular makes this special? Uh, next slide. Um, really is our private sector uh, development partner on the project, uh, Madomi. Uh, Madomi is a pioneering modular construction model for uh, new medium density housing. Uh, and you may recall that we recently entered into an agreement with the Port of Portland uh, at the T2 facility uh, to facilitate a mass timber innovation center. Uh, one of their key tenants is uh, Madomi. Uh, it's the factory where they build units intended for assembly at this uh, gateway project site uh, that we're discussing today. Uh, next slide. So some more background. Um, the gateway district goes way, way back, as I'm sure you, all, you are all sh um, certain of. Uh, and in more recent memory, the Gateway Concept Plan was established in the year 2000. It was envisioned by the City Council as a high-density complement uh, to Central City, um, really uh, another high-density node um, to expand uh, the city. Uh, in a, order to achieve a similar feel to the Central City, the Concept Plan and subsequent Gateway Master Plan established new streets and connections that would facilitate uh, that, that density. Uh, in order to support the effort, we established the Gateway TIF District in 2001. Uh, since then, there have been a series of master plans focused on engaging with the, with the private sector to help catalyze development in the neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a number of those efforts uh, were not uh, uh, successful. Uh, we had challenges engaging with the private sector simply because the market for density that high uh, was not there in Gateway, uh, in spite of its fantastic location. Uh, and through our action planning process, uh, most recently in, in uh, 2016, uh, we identified one of the major impediments to successful development in the Gateway neighborhood was in fact the streets master plan. Uh, and so I'd like to hand it over to Joel to talk about the project specifically. Good afternoon, Chair Cruz, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Joel DeValcourt, uh, project manager in the green team with Brian. Um, and uh, as Brian mentioned, the Gateway master street plan, it was adopted in 2009 um, really meant to provide the, the, the urban street fabric that was meant to drive a lot of redevelopment in the area. Um, and as many as you know, it's, it's not always the framework that, that counts, it's, it's really an implementation. And the challenge has been that a lot of these streets are extremely expensive. Um, there are a number of infrastructure impediments. And so um, in 2016, uh, our gateway action plan, which was uh, adopted by our commissioners, uh, Chair Guzzi may have remembered that, <laughs> uh, and then was also adopted by city council, had a very uh, specific acknowledgement that this master plan did actually impede redevelopment in a number of ways, but in particular, the, the funding for street infrastructure being split between PBOT and Prosper and other entities, as well as the private community, um, really made it challenging particular for super blocks like this. So you'll see uh, the images on the left-hand side here. Um, in teal 
uh, kind of uh, shape the polygon is the David Douglas School District site. They purchased that in 2015. Um, uh, under essentially the impression that this was gonna be a location where a number of educational facilities were gonna be working in tandem. Um, and then the, the area in yellow, which is the current um, proposed Madomi Gateway Project site, previously was a residential structure that was demolished in the early 2000s and was going through various iterations of a project as well. And so this is over several decades, kind of a, a many course corrections and changes, both in code um, and in challenges with the private market to bring us to where we are today. You can switch slides. So this is the, um, the draft site plan. Um, the applicant and developer are still working through um, uh, their kind of preliminary application. They'll be moving into the permitting process uh, in the next few months. But this shows uh, not just the site plan where the housing, which is kind of the central portion, as well as uh, the proposed commercial along 102nd on the right-hand side uh, and Pacific on the north-hand side. Um, the kind of squiggle, Northeast 100th Avenue dedication. Wow. <laughs> that was distracting. Um, is the primary uh, extension that will kind of bisect this uh, roughly 10 acre super block. Um, and then the, at the bottom, Northeast Oregon dedication is a half street that will be added to connect those two pieces. So it's actually two new streets that are created um, that are both adjacent to the school, um, future school site and this particular proposed project site. Um, and I should say if anyone has questions about this or need additional kind of uh, either geographic or, or um, background um, information, please please interrupt and go to the next site, please. Uh, so we have two uh, things coming before you today, both kind of separately going to be adopted, but they're inter deeply intertwined. Uh, the first of which is a development agree agreement between three parties, uh, Prosper, Madomi Gateway, uh, which is Madomi Gateway LLC, um, and the David Douglas School District. Uh, we expect the David Douglas School District to vote on this in the middle of February. Their, our board meetings don't uh, line up super well, so uh, we will hopefully uh, uh, get your uh, approval today, and then we will work out some final details with them, and if there are any major discretion, discrepancies, we'll, we'll um, you know, uh, go through all the necessary requirements to do that cleanup. Um, and it really uh, is primarily around an infrastructure improvement finance package. Uh, Prosper, um, in 2022, when we extended... Uh, really removed uh, the last date or the sunset on the Gateway District. Um, we made a commitment of $3 million for site improvements and other infrastructure investments uh, around the David Doug Douglas school site, and this actually exceeds the amount um, and provides additional gap financing where necessary to make this work. Um, uh, the project itself will be uh, above uh, 200 units. They're still working out the details of the exact unit count. Uh, but it'll include workforce housing um, and a mixed-use activation of, again, uh, of land that has been vacant for nearly 20 years. Um, and it's one of the exciting parts of this as well is that uh, there is no current bond financing for an elementary school at this particular site. And so we've worked out um, some arrangements with David Douglas School District to uh, create some interim uses so that it doesn't continue to be vacant uh, next to this new wonderful project for the next 15 to 20 years as well. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, ensured that all of our construction equity and green building standards are front and center to um, the project, uh, both on the infrastructure pieces, the project as well. Uh, and we expect the actual housing project to be completed by early mid 2027. Next slide, please, Justin. Um, and then the intergovernment agreement, which uh, was specifically to a portion of Prosper's finance uh, for this is between Prosper and the Portland Bureau of Transportation, PBOT. Um, and PBOT will be bringing close to $2 million, uh, which includes both transportation uh, system development credits as well as cash. Um, the credits go to the developer that performs some of that work. Um, and this aligns our TIF funding with <laughs> what little PBOT funding there is in the near term. We got right kind of like in in the 11th hour to get this. Um, so we're really excited to bring this forward at a time when PBOT is still able to provide both a project manager and you know staffing and a commitment to make this project happen. Um, Prosper's uh, uh, in particular, our equity policies around construction and workforce will be applied um, since they are, as we believe, stronger uh, than many of the ones that would be applied um, under other pro similar projects. And so um, our IGA calls that out specifically. And we're hoping that the work will be completed around the middle of 2027 at just about the same time. So um, they are different project timelines, but hopefully will be 
uh, aligned well enough that the streets housing will all be delivered um, at the same time in tw mid 2027. 20, Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a kind of a, a, a wonderfully simple breakdown of uh, the different parties that are uh, providing uh, funding for this. Uh, Peabot on the top in yellow. In the middle is the Madomi Gateway LLC, private development cash, um, and uh, Prosper in green on the bottom for a total of $6,100,000. Next slide, please. And then this is uh, kind of a draft uh, rendering, 3D rendering of kind of looking southwest um, at the project site um, and uh, uh, kind of, you know, really strong corner presence. Um, so we'll be working with the developer as well to make sure that that corner presence, despite the challenges in retail and other kind of commercial activities in the gateway market, um, does have some pedestrian activity flow and connects to the transportation set, uh, center as well as the rest of the neighborhood. Next slide. And so we're hoping uh, that you will be approving both the development agreement and the IGA today. Um, and we have some invited testimony, but feel free to uh, have any questions beforehand if you like, any clarifying questions. Right, and our funds are basically going in in the form of a, essentially a grant, basically, as opposed to any other. Uh, so the 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 funding is structured as, as infrastructure funding. So in our uh, the way we typically structure our budgets is we've got a portion assigned to infrastructure, a portion assigned to grants, and then a portion assigned uh, to to loans and other investments. And so this comes out of the infrastructure uh, okay, line okay. line item. Yeah. Okay. Great. And it, uh, if I can add, um, you may recall roughly 19 months ago. Um, when the Gateway TIF District uh, indebtedness was extended, there was a commitment of $3 million to support infrastructure adjacent to the uh, David Douglas site. Uh, the, this agreement should satisfy uh, that commitment. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate mm -hmm. that. Any further discussion, comments? Okay, all right then, uh, we'll go ahead and vote. We'll vote on these separately, uh, the two resolutions. Oh, excuse testimony. me, I apologize. Testimony as well. Uh, we have uh, Tom Cody, I believe. Hi, uh, Chair Cruz and Commissioners, I'm Tom. Uh, nice to see you and thanks for hearing the matter today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Madomi. It's been quite a, a voyage. We've been working on it for, for years. I've spent my whole career in real estate, and I've kind of dedicated the last, what I m might be the last chapter, to trying to solve the housing crisis in our city, our state, and our country. And uh, we're investing heavily in, in this idea. It's, it's essentially uh, all I'm working on. We, we have a factory in Washington State where we're kind of de-risking and prototyping uh, the first project. The first project we've already deployed units to in Bend. Um, and it's 100% targeting middle income people making between 80 and 120% of AMI. We see that as a huge uh, void and nobody is uh, uh, intentionally supplying purpose building for what is essentially the heartbeat of the American economy. Um, Gateway, the Gateway site, and all the work that you have done to kind of set the stage for development in Gateway um, is 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 the tuning fork goes off there. You you have robust transportation linkages, you have educational institutions, you have services such as the grocery store immediately adjacent, and access to uh, to jobs, and uh, so that gives people the the opportunity to take alternative modes of transit to, to work. Um, so we're, it, it's flat, um, which means it's relatively inexpensive to develop, but for the fact that it needs these critical infrastructure uh, streets, surrounding streets in order to access it, especially because both 102nd and Pacific are transportation corridors uh, and pedestrian corridors where you, where you don't want um, ingress egress points so that the ingress egress is critical from that southern uh, Oregon Street and from the new 100th Street. Um, 
trying to think of what else you might be interested in. I'm open to answering questions about this. We're, we, yeah, we're currently building out our improvements at our permanent factory at Terminal 2. That's 100,000 square feet. Um, we're very committed to your green building and, and uh, minority contracting goals. Um, you might know we built and kind of set the high bar for minority contracting in Portland with our Meyer Memorial Trust project that we developed. The current improvements, though it's not required by, there's no public uh, involvement other than the port just being a landlord. Um, but we're, those improvements are being built by uh, O'Neill Construction as Union Electrical um, and a minority and women-owned business. And we're currently at the sub-tier level. We have 53% minority business participation uh, on, that, on that factory build-out. We're very proud of that. Um, and our units that are going to bend and the units indeed that will be supplied to Gateway are Earth Advantage Platinum which is the highest certification of that, of that system. Um, so thank you for the support, and I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Any questions, comments? Hi, Tom. Uh, Hi. Willie Myers, uh, one of the commissioners. So, um, hey, it's, you mentioned that you're really uh, focused on the contracting equity portion, and I really appreciate that. And I, I know that you're working with some great partners. Can you talk a little bit more about the workforce equity uh, component and what you're doing to make sure that uh, those that are actually installing your product and, and building your product, um, right. that we're getting a reflective workforce in there as well? I think there's, yeah, that there's gonna be new and different opportunities here in Portland than we have up in Ferndale, Washington, which is a you know somewhat rural location, but we have partnered with the local tribe there and with um, the community college system to try to recruit workers to come into the factory. One of the extraordinary things about uh, manufactured housing is unlike a typical construction site, it, w those are not always welcome to all kinds of people and they can be very intimidating. And so building housing in a factory creates an opportunity to invite new workforce participation into the trades and into the housing industry that, that would not otherwise consider it. And honestly, the port has really set the stage um, in, in a very positive way for us to kind of leverage the work that they've done, the partners they've created with Portland Community College and other nonprofit partners uh, to, to essentially funnel uh, a recruitment channel to our, to our factory. And they've been really excited about Hacienda did a prototyping project there, and that's subsequently closed down. So there's no actual construction activity at that campus right now. So we plan to start production there in October, and we would be the first private employer that could actually offer people jobs through those programs that the port has arranged. So that's that's our plan. Oh, that's great. Um, I would probably recommend also maybe reaching out to some of the uh, apprenticeship readiness programs that are out there that are looking in, in job placement programs like Work Systems Inc. Um, that could help connect you uh, to other uh, community benefit organizations that could also help you make sure that we're, we're hitting that reflection number for the yeah. community. So, Thank you. Great. Understood. This is a really exciting project. What, what's your timeline look like for this? <laughs> Um, so we're, like I said, we're, we're, we're building units now, but we want to bring production to Oregon. We, we're, we're only building where we are because there was an opportunity, um, uh, opportunistic opportunity to buy a factory there. We want to have ultimately multiple factories, but the first, the first big milestone is moving production to Oregon. So our tenant improvements will be done at Terminal 2 uh, in about a month. And then we have a fit out and ramp up period. Uh, which, and, and a recruiting uh, and training period that would uh, yield a construction, a production start date in the fall. And this is, Gateway would be the second project, is slated to be the second project produced from the Terminal 2 facility. So it would start construction of modules and site construction a little over a year from now. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Other comments, questions? Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation, too. Exciting project.
So, uh, back to the resolutions. Um, <laughs> who would like to make a motion to approve resolution number 7519? So moved. Okay, do you have a second? Thank you. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then uh, s resolution number 7520. So moved. Thank you. Thank you, all right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, both resolutions passed. Thanks very much. Appreciate your good work. Okay, so now we're going to adjourn again. <laughs> this time for an executive session. Oh, we're not doing one? No, we're done. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. The, the agenda lied. <laughs> Wasn't my fault this time. All right, the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for coming.